so yeah um thank you very much for joining and thank you for having us here so yeah um you introduced us already like ronnie and um is like a colleague working at the uh, near merit team as well as a senior data scientist and i'm benedict working as a deep learning engineer the media team and we will like i will start with a presentation and ronnie will um, show you some live code demo in the middle of it super exciting seeing the library in action so let's start about recommender system so why are we excited about it and why we think this is a super hot topic an interesting topic is Recommender system are like everywhere. If you think about it, personalized almost every services like digital content, e-commerce, social media, digital advertisements, like billions of billions of users. And there's a lot of users, there's a lot of value and data. And um, from a study, it's estimated like 35% of the consumers use this recommendation engine at Amazon and 75% of the users watching something is based on product recommendation. And if you think about it's really hard to use these tools or like some of the tools without recommender systems. Like if you think about how many um, YouTube videos or like videos are online, finding the right one, it's really hard. So recommend, recommender system, it's really helpful for the user. And we're looking today at deep learning recommender system. And a, a few outline like how does recommender system look like and how the data set look like is you see on the left side which is often a tabular data structure where you have like user features and item features. And some of them are categorical, like the user ID and item ID. And then you have like age, which is a numeric and item price is numeric as well. And often you want to predict a user action, which is like click, this could be like zero or one, it could be purchase, it could be watched. It's a similar uh, problem. And a deep learning architecture often looks in the same context which is like you use the categorical features like user ID and item ID and then embed them, often use an embedding layer, which I will show you in a second. And then the numeric features, you concatenate them and you have fully connected layers. And then in the end, you predict the probability as a single output. And this often looks pretty similar and a lot of variation. Um, and for some of you who might not work on recommended system, this looks similar to almost all tabular data problem. If you predict fraud, if you predict like click, or if you forecast something, it's often a tabular data structure. So we looking from the sense of the recommender system as this like really large problems, you have like terabytes of data, but you could apply that to other tabular data problems as well. So as we see, our network in deep learning, or like a tablet deep learning net problem, is often an embedding layer and some fully connected layers. So what is the embedding layer? This is important. If you may have some background of deep learning, you may be familiar with it. But a category is often encoded in less a hot, uh, hot uh, vector and hot vector, meaning the element which is the category is one and the rest is zero. So if you have here five different categories, you have like a vector with five. And the fourth element is one because it's the fourth category. And then you multiply it with a weight matrix. And this is actually, if you think about, this is like the math behind the embedding, would be super inefficient. So what you normally do is you just do an embedding lookup where you have like the ID of the category, which is three. And then you just look up the embedding vector and you have the results. So why is this important? If you compare deep learning uh, recommender system to other deep learning models, you notice they look from the structure differently. So if you look at computer vision, if you know like ResNet, image, uh, sorry, ResNet or DenseNet, they have like hundreds of layers, often convolutional layers, um, and they're like super deep. If you look at NLP, you have some embeddings there, which are for the words, often like your, uh, your dictionary has like 30,000 tokens, 100,000 tokens, and then you have some transformer layers or GRU layers, but it's again, can be deep. But in the recommender system model, you can see that the majority of the parameters are often in the embedding itself. We have like 300 million users, if you like a really large platform. And um, that means you have like 300 million embedding vectors. And normally you have only a few um, uh, fully connected layers in the end, like two, three, four layers. So the structure is, just different, where the majority is made up from these embeddings. So it's important to have solution for these. Like when you, the deep learning frameworks are developed, you start often with like computer vision in the beginning was the use case in NLP, 
Rexus is uh, using more and more deep learning and we're building specialized tools to address these problems. But um, this has, has like really a special character and these we want to optimize or work for it. So what are like the issues? So as, as this is a tabular data, like um, you need to like do feature engineering on it, like normalizing, categorifying, and this can be like super exhaustive, especially if you have like uh, recommender system data sets can be like terabyte size big, and have like billions of rows. The data loading, as you have like a super shallow network, you need to be super efficient to get the data fast into the GPU memory to train. Scaling, as I mentioned, these embedding tables, they can be like 300 million users. This can be like easily 100 gigabytes, which doesn't fit on a single GPU. And deployment, you have um, these, the, these networks to deploy, you need like multiple steps, we will show you later, which are um, difficult as well, if you want to bring into production. So Merlin, we want to address all these use cases. And we looked like in three different use cases. So the first use case where Ronay will show you a demo later is model de development. So we want to build a high accuracy model. And there we want to have like fast iteration as more it it iteration, more experiments we can do. And that means we have like a more, a better model. We want to integrate the feature engineering and model training and we provide the, a lot of uh, pre-implemented functionality and features like architecture, loss function, negative sampling, which I will show you soon. Then the next step is we go to deployment. This means um, we have a high accuracy model, but it's not a value if it's not somewhere deployed, if users cannot use it. So we're providing easy to use um, API to deploy our model to production, but not only the model, you often need a feature store, you need a candidate retrieval model. So you need um, there's like a, a whole pipeline of different components. We make it easy to deploy them. And soon what we target is to go more to production, which includes then like other libraries, including logging and uh, more advanced use cases, which we support uh, in the future. Merlin, uh, I talked a lot about the challenges and like recommender system. What is Merlin? Merlin is like an open source framework targeting like all these different components. So in feature engineering, we have a library which is NV Tabula, designing to go to terabyte scale for feature engineering. In training, we have multiple options depending on your use case. Merlin models is um, have like high quality implementations for recommender system model, intensive flow into PyTorch. Um, in Transformer for React, this is dedicated to session-based and specific transformer architectures. And then we have huge CTR, which is designed when you really scale to like multi-node system. You have terabyte size models and you have like multiple hundreds of terabytes of data sets. And then the deployment part is Triton Infant Server. This is a generic open source software from the media, enables you to deploy TensorFlow, tree based model, PyTorch model, custom model, and so on. And we built um, an integration pipeline to deploy these kind of uh, pipelines easy to Triton, which is in the end Merlin system. So that's a little bit background. You see a set of components that makes all much more sense uh, when we target the different use cases in a second. Finally, um, what are like the values? So like, what is our aim with Merlin? We want to build it end to end. So we're not looking only on, oh, how do we train our recommender system model? We need to do the feature engineering before, we need to do feature storage, we need to bring it to the, uh, production. So we look at really end to end. Then we saw, it's super complicated if you build all these pieces. And we want to make it really easy for the user. So we provide some high level APIs that it's only, um, it's possible with a few lines of code to train and deploy these models. Finally, we're looking at scale. Recommender system are like one of the biggest tablet data problems going up to hundreds of terabytes and um, like billions of records. And we can process this really uh, with our library. And finally, speed, um, as the data sets are big, it has to be super performant. So we can train on single GPU, multi-GPU, multi-node systems, and it's designed to really accelerate your tra training pipeline seeing like 100 X speed ups. Coming to the first use case, model development, uh, looking at NV Tabula and Merlin models. Um, as we said, we want to build like we, in the process to find a good model, a high accurate model. And for there, we 
have like different requirements and different uh, features we provide there. So the first key or like key is really to be fast. Um, we work on a lot of Rexus competition. We work with the Kaggle Grandmaster together. And then we notice as often you see like more, if you do more iterations, you have more insights, you have more experiments, you, get, you increment your model accuracy and you're getting to a higher overall accuracy. So, and if you look at the problem, normally you have your data input as a uh, data set table. You do some feature engineering, a model training and an evaluation. And if you're not happy, you repeat the cycle where you'd be like, hmm, maybe we add this feature. Maybe we process this feature differently or we change the architecture. And if you do a lot of, of these iterations, you get into a higher overall accuracy. And to have this cycle really efficient, we provide something which is the schema file. And the idea is in the feature engineering, you define what kind of feature types you have. So you have often categorical features or numeric features. And based on that, it often defines your neural network architecture. So during your feature engineering process, we define already what we want to do with certain features. And then we don't want to repeat the same definition in the model training. So we provide in the feature engineering from NVTAB provides an output. It's a data schema, which can be loaded by, mod by modern models to define the architectures. And if you, for example, add a new feature, it's automatically in the data schema, it's added to the not model architecture. So you don't have to update the pipeline multiple times, like on multiple steps to add a single feature. Um, what is ME Tabula in a nutshell? Um, ME Tabula in a nutshell is a library for feature engineering. So on the one side, we work on a lot of Rexus problems and then competitions, and we get the knowledge, what we need for feature engineering and add it to our feature engineering library. So you have common feature engineering operators, highly like with high quality implementation, well tested to add it to your pipeline. You can define your pipeline as like a graph with like this pipe pipe operator, which makes it really easy to chain a lot of different commands. It's designed on CPU and GPU, but supports even multi GPU and multi node. And in specific, it scales beyond GPU memory. So we process the data sets in chunks, which always fits on the GPU memory, does the um, transformation and then saves it back. And this makes it really efficient. And we can see like speed up on the right bottom corner, where we go from like three hours down to two minutes. Of course, do you need to process it in two minutes, but your feature engineering could not be, be three hours, it could be like two days. I worked on stuff on CPU, which takes like two days. And then if it runs in an hour on GPU, that's really, really fast. And you can do like way more uh, experiments and like work. Coming to the second part of the model development, Merlin models. So now we've done the feature engineering. Now we have like a library Merlin models, which provides you uh, implementation for classical machine learning or advanced deep learning models. So it supports light of um, implicit boosted trees, but then TensorFlow and a lot of popular TensorFlow uh, uh, deep learning architectures. And the idea is it's well integrated with NVTabula it's easily defined all of these like popular new network architecture and provides you a lot of other functionality required for recommender system, which are like specific loss functions, negative sampling, we will see in a second. These are like, for example, popular uh, network architectures. Defining them like from scratch in TensorFlow or PyTorch are like really complicated. And here you can see, you can use a single line to define three different types of architectures. And each of them uses the schema file as an input. So when you use a metabolo for feature engineering, you can exchange them really quickly without changing anything else. Like you, you just use the schema file, call the DLM model, and then it defines it. And the three popular we have here as an example is like Facebook's deep learning recommender system model. From Google, it's like deep cross network and then YouTube DLM. It always combines the feature in different ways. And much more, like it's a, a quick overview of what we all provide. And that means there's like a lot of um, combinations and possibilities available. It's like, you have like, as I mentioned, classical machine learning, like implicit tree-based, actually light of MS in the list missing. Then in deep learning, you have like matrix factorization, NCF, MLP, DLM, DCN models, which we will models like two tower architecture, YouTube DNN, 
multitask learning, and the loss functions. We provide a lot of different losses, and then other features which are requ required or helpful for recommender system is like ranking matrices or retrieval uh, matrices, different negative sampling tasks when you only have positive examples. And this makes it possible to combine all of these different pieces together and try them out. And each of them are like customizable as well. Like you can define your own architectures, your own blocks, your own negative sampling strategies, and then test them with predefined architectures. So let's, now we're looking at a uh, recommender system demo. Like Ronay will now show you the combination of NV tabular and neural models. Thanks, Benedict. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I just yeah, let me share my screen. To, yeah, now I stop sharing. Okay. okay, I don't see chat now, but I hope you can hear me. You can see my slide. Uh, sorry, my Jupyter notebook, right? I guess. Yes, I can see. Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you for the thumbs up. Hi everyone, this is Ronai and Bill already introduced me. I don't have to introduce myself. Thanks, Benedict, for this presentation. Benedict is going to continue. I would like to just show you what he talked so far. So he mentioned about this, uh, like the iterative loop, loop between data pre-processing and data feature, uh, feature engineering and the model development and model evaluation, if you remember that plot. So I would like to show you how we are actually aiming at this process and making it much easier for recommender system practitioners. It doesn't have to be exactly a recommender system problem. You can also use the tabular data and build uh, deep learning based models or decision tree based models. But uh, our domain actually particular recommender systems. That's why we talk about recommender systems. Even though you are not in the recommender system domain, this is fine. You can still like acquire the knowledge here and customize it if you are using still using tabular data. All right then. So Benedict mentioned about uh, a tabular library. This is our open source feature engineering library on GPU. Uh, but as he mentioned that you can use Envitabular both on GPU and CPU. Uh, so don't worry if you don't have a GPU, if you don't have access to GPU, you can still run Envitabular on CPU, but there are definitely uh, great advantages of using Envitabular on GPU and multi-GPU. As Benny mentioned, he, he himself is actually uh, using terabytes of data in these days, working on a use case, and it's very actually uh, convenient. So. Um, there were some questions in the chat if these libraries are open source. They are open source. So there are ways to uh, install them via Docker or Conda or pip install. You can go and check the readme files, please, or documentations. So I will start by importing the libraries that I would like to use now. So what library I need here? I will need mvtabular. Uh, let me just, so let me just stop this and restart my kernel. Bear with me, sorry, I'm uh, in the, I have to be outside uh, because of Hurricane Ian. <laughs> I'm in a hotel, so bear with me if there's some internet connection problems. Uh, I apologize for that in advance. So let's, yeah. So I'm just setting some seeds because I'm going to use TensorFlow and I would like to reduce the randomization in model parameter generations, etc. And actually in this demo, I'm going to show you how we can use Envitabular and how we can use Merlin models, okay? I already have a data set that I actually cleaned a little bit before, so we don't, we don't need to worry about that, but let me show you what is the data set. First of all, to be able to use Envitabular or Merlin models, we have to create data set objects, Envitabular data set objects, or uh, like we can call them also data set objects. So this actually reads the parquet files and creates some data set objects that this data set objects has uh, um, information for us. So I will show you what I mean. First of all, let's look at the data. What type of data we have? We are using an open source data available on Kaggle called e-commerce data set, e-commerce behavior data set. Data set has user ID, product ID columns, and uh, some user and um, product features okay, like a uh, uh, attributes and event time, basically when this user was interacted with this product. And 
in our data set we have we created a target column normally original data set had uh, event types called purchase add to cart uh, view etc but we actually set the purchase at one and set the cart event as zero just to create a binary classification uh, tabular data for for this demo uh, for this demo purpose so what I need to do, Benedict mentioned about this embedding tables. So you cannot actually feed, a, for example, a string, string column uh, or any other like a float column to uh, a deep learning model. Uh, well, you can, but to to generate to generate a you can feed the float for sure to generate a, uh, to generate embedding lookup. So they need to be contiguous integer uh, integer values, and they need to to be encoded so you want to create this uh actually as i said contiguous integers starting from one to n or zero to n whatever you want how you want to encode them so that's why you actually basically need to categorify them this is what we do we have to categorify our categorical columns that we would like to create embedding tables for this is very critical for us and and tabular is providing very easy uh, uh functionality for, for that there are operators like categorify and i can even set what the type i want from this categorify integer 64 integer 32 and then i am also taking my column either it's a user id column or it's an item id column why because i will use this tagging information in my schema file that benedict already showed you schema file is the key it's creating a seamless integration between the feature engineering and the model development and i'm going to use this tags Actually, this, I will parse this text when I'm building my model. We are not going to do it. It's going to be done under the hood. This is also very good news. And then that will actually help me to create this embedding layer and all the, the necessary input blocks in the model development. All right, let's move fast. So what we did here, we basically encoded the categorical features and just we tag them. Okay. Here we are creating actually, if you are familiar with data science pipelines, you've worked with like uh, scikit-learn or pandas, etc. This is basically pandas things, but you know have to create temporal features with from the daytime objects, right? So you can by using the time set data, you can create the weekday, day, month, hour type of features, right? That's what we are doing here. And easily we can use the lambda up here. And then I can even use a user-defined function, right? I can create a function and by using a lambda, I can actually create, uh, process my data and create a new feature by just using this user defined function. In, in order to do that, I can, I'm also using lambda up again. First, I have a price column. I would like to fill the missing columns with zero. Then I would like to take the logarithms of this column and like the, um, and normalize it. Logarithm to uh, avoid the skewness, normalize is like to scale it. And then I can actually apply this to the relative price to average function, which is doing to taking the average price of the product um, based on the average uh, price. So why? Because price of the product actually changing over time anyway the, the po point here is that you can create a you can put a user defined function and you can actually apply it using the lambda that's the main goal here and i will just want to run this and then what is going to happen here i am actually uh finally uh well this is an important up to benedict mentioned about this uh, engineering uh, Kaggle grandmasters and Kaggle etc uh, Kaggle competition so target encoding has been actually uh, commonly used by a lot of like Kaggle grandmasters especially Nvidia Kaggle grandmasters it's a very important feature that you can use and you can convert the categorical columns to continuous columns I don't uh, have time to deep uh, go deep dive uh, deep dive into target encoding but it's a useful feature engineering technique so Amy Tabler also has a target encoding operator so you can just like define your categorical columns and you can just call the target encoding and give the label uh, column so actually it is um, basically it is going to from a target um, it is going to calculate the statistics from a target variable grouped by the unique values <coughs> of one or more categorical features. So let's run this. And then 
finally, uh, I just want to also include my role user ID and item ID. I had user ID and item ID. I categorified them, meaning that I encoded them, meaning that, for example, my user ID 100 was mapped to one. For example, but I also maybe I want to also include my role user and item IDs in my data set so that maybe I would like to call them back uh, when I do the prediction. All right, then finally, you just call all the outputs and combine them with a plus operator, and then you run the workflow operator here uh, and to create the workflow uh, node. And when you create the workflow, you just fit and the transform. You say that this is my data set. I would like to fit. I would like to collect data uh, statistics. And then I would like to transform my train data set and validate the set. When you transform your validation data set, you transform based on the statistics collected from the train set, right? As you do with the scikit-learn. I'm sure you are familiar with scikit-learn or most of you are familiar with scikit-learn. This is the same phenomenon. All right. And we can, if you want, if you want, we can save this workflow. So normally this is much faster than this, but uh, as I said, my internet has a problem. So let's move on to the next step. So far, let me explain what we did, summarize. We actually process our data. We process our categorical columns. We encoded them so that we can create the embedding lookups, embedding tables. And we actually created some new features by using target encoding and like some user-defined functions. And we actually process our continuous features as well by using normalized operator, by using the local operator. Now, okay, you might, maybe you are wondering, show me how I can build a model, okay? So now we start with, again, creating a data set object. This time I am read, not reading the raw data. This time I'm reading the raw data that came from my process uh, workflow. So when you process this, this data set was actually um, processed and written back to disk. So, and you can see that there is one folder created. It's called categories folder. All the mapping of the categorical columns, they are actually uh, written here as a parquet class. Then I just read back my train and validation set because I need them. I want to feed them to my model. My model needs the data, right? So the important parameter here, the schema. Schema, we need to create the schema object. Schema is important because schema has the information, all the tag, metadata, and the D types. Is this a list column? Is this a categorical column? Is this a continuous column? What is the maximum cardinality of this column? All this information is actually stored in the schema. That's why we need the schema file. So train has the schema information already. When I read back the train file, it has the schema, I'm sorry, it has the schema information. Where is the schema information coming from? It's coming from the MV tabular workflow. We just fit and transform. When we do the fit and transform, automatically we are creating a schema file and it is written back to the disk. So if you go to our output folder, output path, you will see that there is a train folder. Under this train folder, there are process parquet files and there are also there is also a schema file. But I can actually... Uh, print out my schema file easily like that. I can read my train data set as, as a data set object and I can do train.schema. Voila, I see what uh, I see all the columns are tagged properly. I need this tagging information. All right. So, what I'm doing, I'm just getting sorry, what I'm doing, I'm just getting rid of these three columns that I don't want to train my model with. Uh, these are useless. So, I'm just uh, using the without method so I can get rid of these three columns. So, my schema can be without them. So this is my schema. You see, I don't have these three columns in my new schema now, okay? Basically, I'm overwriting my schema. Now I just say, what is my target column? Why I need a target column? Because now I'm going to build a uh, binary classification recommender system model and using some well-known architectures in the literature. And this recommender system model is going to say, do I want to, do I, the, the, the user I or this user is going to purchase this product or not that's the goal okay we would like to give a predicted likelihood that a user is going to predict a item a product so one of the models is well known in the, the recommender system uh, domain by the practitioners is deep learning recommendation model actually uh, dlrm uh, it this was proposed by facebook a while ago a couple of years ago 
And it is actually a very useful technique. Uh, architecture, so it has its own butter multilayer perceptron, which is actually processing the numerical features, which are continuous features, right? We did not categorify them, and there's also embedding layer, and then we do the, we leverage the pairwise interactions, and then we also have a skip connection here from the bottom layer to uh, after we do the pairwise interactions, and we have a skip connection from bottom layer to this concatenation and then layer, and then we concatenate the output of this bottom layer with the uh pairwise interactions output and then we feed them to a new uh, top uh, mlp layer then we generate the click probabilities basically the here the image says click probabilities for us now it's going to be purchase probabilities okay so if you want to build this architecture yourself let's say using a tensorflow it's not going to take three lines four lines ten lines it's going to take much more than this maybe a couple hundred lines of code if you would like to use the boilerplate of code or do everything from scratch from yourself however we reduce it to this like couple lines of code that's it so we have a dlrm model function we say give it a schema why? Why we need schema? Because I need the data about my data, right? So I need this all the information that it, what categorical columns I have. What is the maximum cardinality? Maximum cardinality is very key in the creating embedding tables, uh, etc. Which co columns are continuous? Why? Because I will feed the continuous columns to bottom MLP. I will feed the categorical columns to embedding tables. Okay, that's very. That's everything is in the schema, and then. We parse the schema under the hood, and we also tell what will be the, my embedding dimension for the embedding table. I can put here 32, I don't know, 40 or 26, whatever you want. So I, uh, we just put 64 just for the uh, demonstration purpose. And we define what is our bottom block, which is this bottom MLP. We say, okay, let's define an MLP block with two layers. Each layer has this number of neurons. And the top ML, I just want to define like that. And finally, you just say, what is my prediction tasks? Because Merlin models, this is the Merlin models library I'm presenting right now. Merlin models has different prediction tasks. It doesn't have to be binary classification all the time. You can have next item prediction, multi, even multi-class classification, etc. Right. So I'm just defining my model. So far, the, my, the, the model was defined, nothing else. I didn't fit my model yet. This is going to show you the, all the blocks of my model. And the next step I am going to just compile is you do with the PF Keras. I'm sure this syntax is very familiar because actually this is using the native tray TF Keras. I am defining my optimizer, I'm defining my metrics, and I just feed my train and validation sets and batch size defining my batch size, and I just fit it. That's it. Basically, this and this, that's all took for us to create a DLRM model. Uh, well, it's actually not like that. If you try to code yourself, it will be much, much longer than that. Okay, when it is training, we can see the AUC result coming from our training set. And there will be also AUC result coming from validation set. Why? Because we also fit the validation set. So you can see the validation AUC is here. So don't worry about the validation areas AUC. Is it high, low? Because that's not the purpose of the, this demo. Of course, there are ways to increase this validation AUC. We are not going to talk about that. So let's move on to the next step. Okay, we train this model, but ah, we are not super happy. How about I want to train another model? What do I need to do? I would like to train another model, but I don't want to like go back to do all the feature engineering stuff again and again. I don't have to because I have a schema file now. I can feed the schema file easily to another model. That's what Benedict was talking about. This iterative process is now very easy. Why? Because I have the schema file. I can even choose what what columns I would like to fit to what model. I, so for example, I can create 100 features, but I can only feed the 10 of them or 20 of them or five of them to any model. Easily with the schema, I can do that. I can say that schema select by tag, select by name. So I can select only these columns. Or So my model is not going to be trained with 100 features. It's going to be trained only with five features. So now I would like to train this DCN model, which is another well-known deep cross network architectures in the literature. It is actually leveraging both, both the explicit feature interactions of the inputs through the cross layers and the, and the combined uh, combining it with a deep neural network to learn complementary implicit inter interactions. Unfortunately, in the, the interest of time, we don't have time to go deeper and explain everything in these architectures. Uh, but 
I mean, all these notebooks are available in our GitHub repo, so we will share the link so you can definitely go and read the papers. So it's another deep learning based architecture and it has this feature crossing technique and actually leveraging the um, interactions between the features, okay? Again, if you want to code it yourself, it's not going to take three lines of code. It's going to take maybe 300 lines of code. So we just run this. We call the DCN model function, provide all the requir required things, schema and the depth of the architecture. We are going to use the stack, actually. Depth is showing us how many cross layers we are stacking together. And then there is this deep block. See this deep network? We are defining the architecture of the deep block. And then we say, OK, I'm going to just run the prediction uh, of the binary classification task, okay? We just run this and uh, we compile, same thing. This is exactly the same, what you see above, nothing changed. All right, this is gonna train it. So now it's going to train, I might say, this is very common practice, right? In the data science challenges, people are never training only one single model. They have like such and such and such. They have a lot of models, maybe 10, more than 10, and then they just create ensembles. It doesn't have to be exact, always the same type. It can be flexible, deep learning, something else. Uh, so, okay, we train this and maybe we are saying, well, how about if you want to try, try XGBoost? Why not, right? Maybe we are not happy with the accuracy we are getting here. So that's also available with Merlin models. We actually can train an XGBoost model easily. So we feed the schema again. We try and tra uh, define the XGBoost parameters. What is the objective? Is it going to run on GPU or not? And what is the evaluation metric that uh, we use? It's the AUC, how many boosts, uh, et cetera, uh, boost runs it should run. And then that can be also defined easily. And we also ge generate the metrics, evaluation metrics with the model that evaluate, okay? This is going to run on a distributed fashion on the GPU. That's why you can see, for example, if it delete this, maybe it's not gonna delete it because it's not. If I delete this, it's going to call the dask under the hood. You will see that I will have a new dask worker now it's empty, but you will see it's going to be, it's not going to be empty because it's going to run the distributed fashion on the loop. So that's going to finish. You can see, I know that was a little bit fast because there are a lot of things to talk. Uh, so it just finished and you can see the metrics that we assigned here, that you can print it out. It's actually this one. So you can see that my now I have the dust worker because as I said, this is running under the distribution fashion and to make it faster. Um, that's it from my side. Benedict, please go ahead, take it over. Uh, sorry if I use your time. <laughs> my time is longer than expected. I'm going to mute myself, stop sharing. Please take over and I will answer the questions. So, yeah, thank you very much, Ronnie. Like, um, it's fine. Like, this was the important part of our workshop or presentation. Um, I think I want to highlight or like recapture like what Ronnie showed was we. She did some feature engineering with MD Tabula and then trained with Merlin models like once uh, a DLM model, a DCM model, and even a boosted tree model. I think what is great is like how easy they are integrated with each, like the two libraries with each other to define these architectures easily. And under the hood, we don't show right now, but you can see MD Tabula would scale to multi GPU in the background, similar for HG Boost. You have soon multi GPU data parallel training for TensorFlow or for Merlin models available. So, yeah, um, this is like the starting point, and then you can deploy it easily. Um, in the interest of time, like we, we go to the second part. So, uh, we had a demo about training a commander system. So, we want to show some additional functionality which might be. Re uh, relevant or like important for you and just touch base it a little bit. If you have more questions, feel free to reach out, feel free to look at our uh, GitHub repository. Everything is open source, everything is on GitHub. So if you're interested in anything, feel free. So another point is a new trend in recommender system is session-based recommender system, um, which has a lot of functionality, like properties at the same time, it provides higher accuracy. And the main problem you want to challenge is like, for example, in an e-commerce setting, the user interests change between sessions. Like one, you need a new smart TV and then you need a new smartphone. So the recommendation should be aware that you 
were like looking maybe for high price TVs, and now you're interested in high price smartphones, or maybe the other way around. So there's context you can extract, but you need to be familiar of the current context. So, and there, this is often solved by using session based. There we have the library transformer for REC, which is efficient and flexible open source library to deal with sequential and session based recommendation system. And it provides a lot of state of the art transformer architectures. Specific at using a hugging phrase, um, hugging face transformer or like library as a backbone. And so you can use all the new transformer architectures there designed for recommender system tasks. Um, and this is like easy to use. Feel free to check out our GitHub repository, how the architecture looks like. And Metabola process the data to have like session aggregated data. And then you can feel it easy to do our transform for REC library. And actually, you can deploy it on Triton Infant Server as well. Um, another important point I mentioned is how to deal with these really large embedding tables. I work right now on a project. I need to deal with 100 million of um, users. And then you have like embedding tables that can go up to like 20, 30 gigabytes. But then you have the duplication in the optimizer, and you have the gradients, and you need actually to account for maybe 100 gigabytes. How to do that? And there, you want to um scale by model and data parallel and what that means is the model parallel is you split the large embedding tables over multiple gpu so if you have like one large embedding table and you have like four gpus you every gpu gets like 25 percent and then the rest of the model which is then data parallel is like the fully connected layers and every gpu gets the same copy of it and that way you can efficiently have a high school in the data parallel part. And then the sparse part of the embeddings um, that, that you can train model parallel. And then we have like different options. One is our custom deep learning framework, huge CTR. And then we exported this functionality to TensorFlow where you can use um, one Merlin sparse optimization kit, it's called, for TensorFlow 1.x, and then distributed embeddings for TensorFlow 2.x. And finally, deploying. So I make it really quick uh, in, the, in terms of time. So finally, we all talked about training, but it's only valuable if you deploy it. And deploying recommender system is not easy. Like recommender models is like a single model, but a system is like actually a group of a lot of different components. And we have like a retrieval component, which is if you think about a social media website or like a video streaming website, you have like millions, even maybe billion of items. Like you think about all the social media posts. So you cannot use a, a, a compute intense deep learning model to score from one user all items and say like, hey, which are um, relevant? So you want to filter. They like different methods, methods and even like optimized models, which are like highly efficient to provide you a good list of candidates. When you have the candidates, you need to filter them. For example, um, when a user blocked some users, like authors on social media, you don't want to show the items of them. Then you want to uh, provide a score that you use a more compute intense deep learning model. And finally, some reordering, for example, you don't want that all the posts he sees are from the same user. So you want maybe to add some diversity. Here like different examples. You look at social media. I think another intuitive one is the online store. You want to look at items which are like maybe relevant for those users. You want to filter out out of stock items. Then for the candidates, you want to predict the likelihood they want to purchase it. And finally to reorder it maybe on price points or like you want to have diversity in colors or brands in it. And these four stages are not only on the online side, even on the offline side, you need to do different things in the sense of retrieval model training and then you need to deploy them and you need to pull the, all these components together. And there's a lot of engineering work done in companies to that all these systems communicate with each other, then you update them, you retrain them frequently, and this is really complex. Um, there's like right now we're dealing uh, like Merlin models provides you for the retrieval side and then scoring using Emitabula and Merlin models. And then the orchestration is done with Merlin systems. Yeah, this is like the Merlin system part. Um, how does it look like? Um, this is like on the right side, you see like this more complex pipeline we described with the four stages. On the left side, you can see you can define them with 50 line of codes. Similar to any tabular, you chain these different commands and you always provide like the input and then 
you get an output from it. And there you can have this pipeline written down in like 50 lines. Um, so far, we have the four two use cases. We are working on the next use case to integrate more components and logging into it. So there's still some work to do. Some stuff I want to mention, like we in the Merlin team are not only working on systems and building integration system, we are working active on the recommender system, um, the community um, submitting research papers. So some selected papers are transformer for rec, our GPU specialized in, um, parameter server and general our framework. We work on recommender system challenges. So we test our libraries on this because you get like well-defined problems and you have like comparison between other teams. And here you can see we won fourth time of first place. This year we got the third place. There was a pretty close challenge. And it's like a lot of domains from social media, e-commerce, travel, um, fashion e-commerce. Yeah, so we're working here actively. Finally, some resources in the chat. There were a lot of questions already about resources. It's all open source. If you have feature requests, feel free to file it. We're looking into it to the final roadmap. If you run into issues, bugs, or have questions or problems, feel free to file them. We are always looking to respond quickly. Then in addition, we have some blog posts um, available and recordings. Uh, we share the presentation and you uh, get the links. Um, finally, our last slide is um, what's the value again? It's an open source software and we want to make it efficient to use GPU memory uh, by using like an efficient data loader or train on multiple GPUs. Um, we have some exam like some work for like caching frequent embeddings for like inference or training comparison model easily and deploying to production. So thank you very much. Um, we might can answer one or two questions from the Q&A. Great. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Bernie and uh, Ronnie for the presentation and the share the uh, the system to us. Uh, yeah, so uh, if you have quen uh, just a quick reminder, if you have questions, feel free to type in the chat. Or if you want to speak uh, to ask questions to discussions, uh, feel free to raise your hand. I can unmute you. Uh, we have a few minutes for the Q&A. All right, uh, is Dinesh, please go ahead. Hi. Hi. Uh, yes, Hello. we can hear you. Go ahead. Uh, um, my, uh, hi, thank you for this wonderful presentation. My question is, how, uh, what is the cardinal role of this uh, schema in this, uh, in this context? Yeah. Am I clear? So yeah, the, the schema file is just like, uh, it's a configuration file between our different libraries. And you as a user, you don't want to define information twice. So when you do something in the feature engineering, which is normally the first step, you don't want that this, that you, when you define there something, you want to redefine it in the model training step. And the schema file is a redefined schema from the data set schema, but in the end, it's a configuration file providing a lot of information which is captured during feature engineering for the model training. And it's kind of a JSON file, it's a special file, but you can imagine like as a JSON proto, I think proto, yeah. Yeah, it's proto text, but it can be also JSON, exactly. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the nice presentation. Um, 